sorry uh, for the tardiness today. I was at the doctor's office and it just, it ran over. So thank you for your patience. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. And we're, um, we're now looking at some of the projects. And I think that Sam and Colin have already gone. So uh, who would like to go? Let's, uh, Trevor, let's go with you. Let's, um, let's talk about your project, if you will. Okay, uh, give me a second to put it up. Can anyone see my uh, screen okay? Okay, yes. All right, uh, so this is uh, my laptop, the world's newest detective mystery author. <clears throat> and so start, um, so some inspiration behind this. Uh, I'm a huge fan of reading, I really like to read a lot. And another part of it was uh, my sister, when she was on Thanksgiving break, the family she was with had watched a bunch of Hallmark movies. She said by the end of it, she was like, I watched so many movies, I felt like I could just, you know, recite an entire plot line of a Hallmark movie from scratch, <laughs> just make up my own. And I was like, oh, you know, I've heard some things about uh, people doing that with like infomercials. Uh, so I wonder if I can do that with like a Sherlock Holmes book. Um, and so I looked online and I found a book, uh, an online text uh, that didn't have a lot of unnecessary space in the beginning of it. And I uh, came up with some pretty interesting results. Um, so how does it work? This is different than normal uh, approach to text generation because normally you just uh, guess entire words based on the surrounding words. However, this neural network uh, attempts to predict the most probable character given a, a previous sequence. So you put in a sequence of characters and then the target uh, sequence is shifted over by one. So for example, uh, if you have a sequence length of six and you have an input sequence of just Holmes, but without the S at the end, you shift it over to the right by a single character, then the target sequence is Holmes without the H. And so as it passes through the total sequence, the layers attempt to predict the likelihood of the next character. So um, it uses an atom optimizer, which is just a replacement optimization algorithm to minimize loss. Um, I initially started with the first paragraph from the short story, The Adventure of the Engineer's Thumb. I felt like that was an appropriate short story to choose um, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and with the word Holmes as the start of the input sequence. Um, using the first paragraph from the short story, I started with three separate generations, one with 64 epochs, one with 150, and then the third generation with 200. Now, Trevor, was this, uh, was this your own software or using something like GPT-3 or? Um... Well, this is using uh, TensorFlow. TensorFlow, uh, yeah, okay, TensorFlow, but what, uh, what set of programs in TensorFlow, I guess? What do you mean, like the functions and stuff using? Yeah, or... was this was this a program which you just was available in TensorFlow? No, this is something that I had to come up with using like Keras models and whatnot to build my own training model. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so uh, the number of tests within each epoch uh, was dependent on the number of unique characters within the selected training sequence. Uh, which ended up being around, you know, 74, 75 unique characters per paragraph. Um, and then, however, after the first uh, trio of generations, the text was mostly illegible, and I'll show that later. Um, so I included the entirety of the second paragraph and increased the epochs at 300, which resulted in much better text generation. And so to start off, uh, this is the first paragraph. Um, I won't go ahead and read it, but... Um, as you can see, uh, it's just the first paragraph of the short story. And I'm actually going to zoom out so you can see <laughs> the change in text. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of red lines. The first generation produced a lot of gibberish. <laughs> um, however, you can see some of shorter words, such as I, and, had, said, he, Care. A lot of the shorter words were actually able to be properly predicted. Well, so Trevor, what was this? What was this trained on? I don't get what it was trained on. 
So it was trained using uh, the first paragraph. It goes through and like blocks out sequences of text, trains it using the like uh, blocks of text, goes through and comes up with a model out of that and then generates an entirely separate paragraph all on its own. So the only training data was this first paragraph, is that right? For this first set of uh, generations, yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> and the way it starts off is you give it an input sequence, so, or the input phrase. So the input phrase was always just Holmes and to see where it came from there. So this first generation, a lot of gibberish. Uh, second generation, you can see as uh, some bigger words are starting to become more prevalent, you know, opened, corridor, breakfast, um, search. <laughs> There's a full sentence here, I am sorry to have interrupted you. Um, as you can see, however, there's still a lot of um, gibberish in terms of apostrophes and quotation marks coming out through this. Uh, so what happened page. between the first and the second? I, I'm not getting the details here. What happened between the first and the second generation? What did you change? I changed the amount of time or the epochs, which is the amount of times that it goes through the training set. So, I see. okay. Oh, I, I see. Know. Okay. Yes. Yes. You have that at the top. Good. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So then in the third generation, I bumped it up to 200. Um, however, I didn't see much change between the total number of uh, words that weren't complete gibberish. And so um, noticing this, I decided to increase the training set to include the second paragraph as well. And then I bumped the epochs up to 300 and was able to actually obtain this here um, paragraph. As you can see, there's only six words that are misspelled. There's a single grammatical error, but and then I'll zoom back in. Um, it's actually starting to produce full sentences. Granted, the second sentence here is a bit of a run on, um, but it is starting to produce full sentences and even some quotations with um, themes that have, what was it? It still follows the same train of thought. So for example, in this long run on sentence, um, it talks about uh, landing in a rose bush and his hand was throbbing painfully. And so you can see that the um, neural network is beginning to string thoughts together using this um, generative capability. And so what could be improved? Uh, increasing the total number of paragraphs um, in the training so, set. Okay, so this was a, a, you're using a GAN here or something? I'm just using a recursive neural network in order to go through and check the text. Okay, well, that recursive neural network needs trained by more than just your first paragraph. What else was it trained with? Well, that's why I added the second paragraph. And well, even, uh, even two paragraphs is not enough to train a recursive neural network. Well, or, or are you claiming it is? So, because there are still issues in this fourth generation, no, it isn't enough to train it. However, there was a large area of improvement between using one paragraph versus using both paragraphs, at least to begin with. Okay, go ahead. Um, so yeah, by, like I just said, the uh, increasing the number of paragraphs to decrease the total amount of um, spelling errors and grammatical errors. Um, however, the neural network does tend to produce more run-on sentences. Um, and so I think moving forward, if I were to increase to more paragraphs or even just the entirety of the short story itself and run it through to try and um, maximize the amount of epochs without overfitting the solution could lead to a how better did you, story. How did you choose the, um, the, the architecture for the neural network, for the recursive neural network? So there, it was a... Um, in the text generation part of it, in, uh, I'm taking Dr. Dong's deep learning class, and we had talked about using uh, recur or, yeah, recursive neural networks for just word generation. And so that was why I decided to use a recursive neural network. Okay, but again, what, what, is, what is the structure of the, neural, the recursive neural network that you used? I mean, how many neurons, how many layers, how many feedback loops? Uh, you got a lot of parameters to choose. So I'm running through, uh, I believe, 256 layers. 
going through each about a thousand times. Wow. Okay. What uh, recurrent unit did you use? Are you using like a transformer layer, a GRU, a LSTM? L uh, LSTM, yeah. Is it like unidirectional or bidirectional or? It's a unidirectional because it's just going through the sequences. It's not going back and forth through the sequences. It's just going through one time. So is it just character by character? You no, know, like word to vec or anything? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Uh, yeah, make sure you, the complete report is uh, put in box. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, uh, uh, Matthew, you ready? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you just exactly right. All right. Let me once again figure out how to present. Nope, it doesn't seem one away. Okay. While you're doing that, I am going to move. You notice I am not in my normal fancy place today. And that was because of a lot of things going on. So just let me move here. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. All good? It's good. All right. My, I'm making a uh, <clears throat> correlational neural network uh, that is to detect springs from satellite imagery. I call it SpringNet. So um, the, the tools that I'm using, of course, Python, I kind of chose at random to do PyTorch as my framework. And then I'm working in, I started off developing locally and due to uh, the presentation that we saw, decided to move over to, that was Justin's presentation, right? Uh, we, I decided to try it out on Colab. So here's the data that I've got. Um, there's a site called databasein.org. Um, this contains, and in here there was a map, a data set that had known confirmed locations of springs, freshwater springs, in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, and Louisiana. And for each one of these points, um, the data set contains the longitude and latitude of those spring locations. Um, and this data came, it's a special format or file format called GIS, uh, Geo Information Systems. I believe that's what it is. Um, and so, yeah, I couldn't find a, when, wherever there's a data set that's nice to work with, there's always an application that someone's already built with it. So in trying to find a unique neural network to build, I had to find a unique data set. So the other part of the data, I am using the Google Static Maps API, um, where you can construct this URL with the, with the uh, query strings to such that you can specify longitude and latitude, uh, zoom, size of the image. You send this URL and you get an image back, like the image that you see here. Can you all see my mouse? Okay. And so the positive cases that will be going into my neural network are the satellite image, the satellite images that correspond to those data points. The negative cases are um, GPS location or longitude and latitude points chosen at random. And then it's cycled through to make sure that they're sufficiently far from the nearest confirmed spring. And so those are my positive and negative cases that will go into my convolutional neural network. So, to uh, freshen up on the theory that it is uh, for a convolutional neural network, we have an image with a certain size of kernel. Uh, we convolute through here or correlate. And then we pool it. We do it again. We pool it. We do it again. We pull it. And then we flatten that layer. And that goes into our fully connected layer. And I'm doing a binary classifier 
And so instead of these three classes, I just have one, one output. So here's my specific designs. I use three convolution layers. Uh, each one is followed by a, uh, a, a ReLU activation. It just slipped my mind what that stands for. But it's a very simple, it's linear. Looks like the, uh, it goes to zero and is at zero until it, it uh, hits the origin and then it goes up. And then a two by two max pooling for the pooling there. And then I also have three fully connected layers. Um, so you have the first one that takes, it's the first fully connected layer that you see right here. Um, that would be, for example, this, that the convolution feeds directly into after flattening. And then I have the hidden layer that is, um, would be in here. And then I have the output layer, which outputs the size of one. And I can talk to, about the sizes of these layers, the number of inputs, the number of channels and kernel sizes and stuff like that, if people are interested. I am using, um, um, let's see, a binary cross entropy for the loss function. And then the stochastic gradient descent for my optimizer or my training optimizer, I should say. So the, um, I have 400 training samples. Uh, this is because uh, I realized pretty late into the project that I wasn't getting all of the uh, data points. I was only getting the data points in Arkansas, which I'm from Arkansas, and so I was fine with that. Um, but I have 200 positive cases and 200 negative cases. I ran through this with 50 epochs, was a batch size of 50. And so that's eight steps um, per epoch. And as you see in my loss, it drops initially uh, within the first, you know, 20 or so batches or yeah. And then it doesn't really go down. Um, I have something wrong with my neural network because I should be able to memorize the training set at least. But because this doesn't even drop below, you know, 0.5, um, uh, the neural network needs some tweaking, the sizes and stuff. I haven't ever done any neural network, so this is all very new to me. And so <laughs> I'm glad it kind of works. So the testing, I have 100 test samples to verify the results, 50 positive, 50 negative. And we came out with an accuracy of 56% in the, in the testing at the end. And in this image here, you can see a few of the uh, pictures that it got wrong and got right. Um, for the positive cases, you see this one that it got correct. Um, and it's kind of dark, greeny, somewhat roughish terrain. And then the negative that it got correct uh, is just flat. It makes sense there's, some, there's not a spring there. So these look like two easy cases. The ones that it got incorrect was it said this one, the lower left, was not a spring when it really was. As you can see, it's a little more barren than these others, these other two. And the negative that it got incorrect um, looks more green. And so it makes sense why it gets wrong the ones that it did and that it gets right the ones that it did. The 56% accuracy isn't great. However, with uh, only the 400 test samples, this at least proves that there is something to this method. As I said before, the training could use some help. Uh, the parameters in the, such as the number of neurons, the number of layers, uh, because we should be able to memorize that. Uh, 50, above 50% 50 means there's something to this. There's something that could be used here. Um, maybe if there was better data, better training. And I was able to get a unique data set with a unique application, which was, took me a while to find something that was unique. There's so much going on out there. And then there is a lot of data sets out there with this GIS format. And satellite imagery is something that's updated. Uh, you can get subscriptions to get live, you know, within a few days of old satellite images. 
And so that opens all the options. To improve it, could have more training samples, for example, figure out how to get the ones from Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Louisiana. Um, instead of just having an RGB image, we could do something like altitude or some other type of image. It doesn't have to be just RGB, a picture. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, refining the neural network structure and a little more experience with neural networks because um, this is my first time. So I think that's all I have. Now, what this would you get here? OK. In case anyone wants my resources, I found this tutorial very helpful. Any questions? Uh, I have one. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that for the negative cases, you kind of just chose random latitude and longitude. Did you bound them to like certain states or yeah. like what range? Or, yeah. uh, in this case, I bound it to Arkansas. So I took a point right here and I took a point right there and I generated a random latitude and longitude in between. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick question about, uh, you had that uh, loss curve with the number of epochs. It looked like it was converging to 0. 0.69, which is basically random guessing with cross entropy. Was that your training or your validation loss? Um, oh, sorry, this is training. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What, why do you say the 0. 0.69 was like a coin flip? Um, so if you, I think that's the log of, or what would that be? It's either log of a, log of a half or a half of log of a half. Uh, I'd have to feed it through the, uh, the binary cross entropy formula, but, uh, right. Yeah. So the actual value is landing right around 0.67, which lines up with the several times I ran, I've gotten between like 56 to 60% accuracy. So obviously yeah. it's not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. pretty close to a coin flip, but it's like a coin flip that's slightly heavier on one side. And so maybe with a better data set and better uh, expertise, domain expertise in developing a neural network, then uh, yeah. you can get that accuracy higher. Just looking at those images by hand, it looks like, I mean, even for a human, it might be kind of difficult to determine that without additional data. Right, that's why I was thinking getting some kind of, not necessarily an RGB satellite image, but some kind of terrain altitude, uh, some other kind of image might help. Any question? Okay, thank you. Uh, because of time, let's go ahead and move on. What is this? Is this, uh, oh, that's something else. Okay, uh, uh, Ming Kung. Hi. Okay, let me share. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so my topic is the auto logos uh, recognition. So I was making a, a classifier. So uh, I choose five uh, classes of the logo BMW, Honda, Toyota, Nissan, Ford. I just want the computer to recognize which logo is, is what. So the, uh, the data set sources, I just download the pictures from the Google image. So for example, these are the, the logos for the, the one, uh, one, one logo that is Toyota. So this is, uh, uh, this is one data set. And I uh, have the training data and the test data. And uh, for example, this is the, uh, my training data for BWM. And this is my test data for BWM. And you can see actually the data is, there's not so, uh, there's not so many data. This is because uh, well, actually the data is uh, is actually really me. If I have time, and maybe I can uh, find more data. And uh, uh, and uh, I was using the Python and use the Jupyter Novo and the software uh, I use is the TensorFlow. And so first of all, I need to uh, locate each of the uh, directory, the, the image in which kind of the directory. And then I have the pre-processing of the image. Uh, I need to, for each of the 
for each of the test and the training data set, I need to uh, resize the image to the 64 to 64 pixels. Well, actually, that's 64 by 64 by 3, and 3 means RGB. And uh, uh, here's something like I just, uh, I need to choose the uh, 64 by 64 by 3 by RGB because some, some of them are uh, grayscale. I just discard the, discard the grayscale and choose the RGB files. And then, uh, and then I make the uh, X and Y. So X means the image, and Y means the the name of the the, the name of the class, right? Like BMW, Honda, Toyota, Ford, and Nissan. So the next part, I was uh, next part is the normalization. So I need to normalize it to divided by two hundred and fifty five. And next part is the uh, the training part. So I use the TensorFlow the cars and import this. Then this is the uh, neural network that I built. So I have the convolutional 2D network, the max pooling and the flatten and dense layer. The output I make it as the uh, uh, dense layer is five because I have five classes. And uh, optimize, optimizes, I have added losses, sparse, uh, cata, uh, what's this? sparse category called cross tropy and, and matrix accuracy. And uh, finally, uh, I need to predict uh, uh, predict my model. So, uh, and and I see this is the how this is I use my test uh, uh, my test uh, data to predict. And we we'll see we can see the evaluation. The accuracy is about, but uh, well, actually it's about it's about 0.62. And uh, actually. Um, Actually, uh, this is the, uh, I also compare with uh, different classes. So I, I just reduce this to four, three, two. And uh, we can see that the accuracy is uh, actually increased. It's actually increased because have, we have less classes. So we don't have too many classes. So it will be easier to, for the computer to uh, classify which class, uh, which class is which. And I think the, uh, the problem of my accuracy, uh, see the accuracy is not too high. I think this is because that, uh, this is because I don't have so many, uh, I don't have so many image, but but it's something that it works because I think because it, because the, you mean the logos is relatively, uh, relatively easier to recognize. So when, when the computer is featuring this, uh, featuring these logos, so it will, the, something like the algorithm will be more obvious. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the end of the uh, project. So, what was the accuracy? I didn't get that. Oh, uh, the, ac uh, the accuracy uh, here. The accuracy is here is uh, upon sixty-two. Okay, it seems to me to be a pretty simple problem. You know, with the clarity of the logos that you used. Do you agree, or do you think it was? What do you think? Uh, I'm, uh, actually, I'm, I'm not quite. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but I think I think the, the thing is that because I have more, uh, I have more classes. So the logo, or maybe the the benefit of the logo is that it will be uh, easier for the computer to recognize. Okay. Okay. Well, for purposes of time, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, this brings us up to Innocent now. Innocent, how you doing? You're muted. Yeah, I noticed that I was muted. So let okay. me just share the screen. Yeah. Uh, first of all, start the presentation. So I guess you all can see my screen, right? Yeah, can you see the screen yes, I'm sharing? Thank you. Okay. okay. So what I did for the project is trying to use a neural networks to model because our, in our lab, we are trying to like build them controls for 
a solid oxide fuel cell plant. So we are trying to use um, a model predictive control, which requires a kind of a lower model of the plants we are trying to control. So I uh, try to like use um, neural networks to model the properties or rather to model the fuel cell stack. So that's the topic I have here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, I've been trying to move to the next page, but it wasn't working. So an overview of what I've, I've been talking today is um, intro, uh, give a bit introduction of <clears throat> um, what the fuel cell stack is all about, then talk about the the max network that I use to um, create the model and probably the design, the designing of the model and the training process. And then we look at some results that was used to validate the model. So basically, solid oxide fuel cell is basically a device that has a kind of a similar similar properties as a, as a battery, we all know. So, but in this case, it uses um, hydrogen as its um, fuel. So um, it has like a very high um, efficiency. I guess I'll just keep this part because this is basically what we are kind of interested in. But if you're interested, you can see some properties of the fuel cell. So like I said previously, we are trying to like use an um, MPC to like, develop a control for the plants and for that we need a lower a low order model in order to implement the mpc so for the max network which stands for the non-linear autoregressive and exogenous model uh that's like what i use because it's kind it has the properties of being able to like predict um to do some predictions so algebraically, this um, model can be represented by just a function of the previous outputs with the previous external inputs and the current external inputs. So the model basically just takes the previous inputs of the previous inputs and the current input and also the past output to be able to like predict what the next output should be, which is basically what we need, a model that will be able to like give us a prediction of what the next um, output of the plan should be. So basically um, the dynamics we are kind of interested to control is basically the voltage of the, the voltage the fuel cell stack produces, the fuel utilization, which is kind of a very useful property for the fuel cell because it has a lot to do with them um, how or let me say the health of the fuel cell stack then we are also kind of interested in the temperature so one interesting thing in this um, project was uh, at first i tried using just a single max to model these um, three dynamics that's trying to like get these three outputs using just a single model but was quite um, unsuccessful. So what I did was trying to like model them individually to like get a single model that would be giving me like the voltage and output and another one that would be giving me like a prediction for the fuel, what the fuel utilization of the stack is. Then another one to like predict what the temperature is. So um, now comes the issue of being able to like select what's the necessary um, input to the models should be. So I have to like resort back to some, um, resort back to some equations or yeah, equations of the dynamics of the plants of the stack. So from there, using what we have here, I was able to pick up the, properties that affects the voltage to be kind of in the pressure of the hydrogen, pressure of, of the water that is produced, pressure of the oxygen. And like, you know, you have to like also fill in the previous 
predicted and voltages to the model. Then for the temperature, I had a current voltage, the mass of water that is um, moving in and out, mass of hydrogen, then the time, and like always, the previous and temperature predictions we have used as the input to the temperature dynamics model. Then for the field utilization, we have the current hydro, the high, yeah, hydrogen and the fuel utilization. Then in order to generate the training data to be used for the training of the model, uh, because what we have is more of a mathematical model. So we have to like excite the plants. So this um, inputs we are sent into the plants in order to like get the readings for the necessary data we ne I need to build the model. So in order to have enough data, how to like apply these um, inputs in a sampling time of um, 0 0.01 second. So with this, I was able to generate enough data to train the model with. So another thing that I forgot to mention previously when I was, or one of the challenges, because one of the challenges I faced with temperature is being able to, because at the initial time when I was trying to train, I didn't include the time as a factor here, but So yeah, this, this was the input sent into the plant to generate the training data needed to train the model that I created. So um, right here is kind of um, the results of the model of the training, the validation and the test. Something interesting to point out is because all these are the mean square error. Uh, because right here, you can see that the voltage has a very high mean square error. But I think I'll attribute that to the, the spark, because whenever you have a little change in the, in the input to the plant, you kind of have a kind of a voltage spike. So I, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons why I had um, this um, high value for the mean square error for the voltage. Then, Right here is just the testing of the model, the results that was gotten. So what I did here was trying to like send in a ramping fuel inputs and current into the stack. Then I compared the results of the model created with what the plant is actually given. So right here, you can see that we are, and the model is in doing a very good job in getting the in predicting what the value should be. So I also did another test by supplying kind of a, a step fuel input and step current inputs. So comparing the results of the model design with the actual model itself, you can see that the, the model design is doing quite well. So, uh, yeah, I guess this is what I have, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you're wondering, uh, I did all this using um, the neural network two bus in the um, math lab. I didn't make use of um, Python. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, any questions at all? I have a quick question. Um, first of all, a really interesting uh, application area. Um, it looked like your architecture was sort of like used a, a sliding window uh, on your time series data. Uh, I was curious if you ever tried using like a recurrent neural network um, to sort of learn the guess, dynamics that way. Yeah, this knot is kind of a recurrent um, neural network, I think. Oh, is that like kind of a... An, a folded view of the network? 
So like, is it implicitly passing variables to the next iteration or is it sort of implicitly recurrent where you're just passing in the, the previous time values? I guess I'm not getting your question, sorry. Or uh, I, I guess like, is the neural network taking in, you know, the time series data in a window uh, up to the current point or is it, um, are you actually training, like, are you training it on long sequences or between uh, showing it the next data point, it's actually maintaining an internal state? Or is that is it sort of stateless, meaning you're sort of like feeding in a, a chunks of the, the time series data? Yeah, I'm kind of a, so what I did was I had to like select like two previous time steps. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, yeah, I think it does. I, I've never heard of this model before, so uh, oh. that's why I'm kind of curious. Okay, good. Thank you, Colin. Um, Innocent, anything else? No, this should be all for now. Yeah. Okay, anything else from anybody? Okay, I think we'll, we'll stop here and we'll start the, the, uh, the, the, the paper summaries on Thursday. We have two more classes. That gives each of you about 20 minutes to give your paper, okay? So make sure that it's something that even I can understand, okay? Uh, make it nice and clear, and uh, and uh, don't 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 assume anything. Okay. Any other any other comments or anything before we call it call it a day? Uh, Dr. Marks, if you have a few minutes after, I just okay. Have... That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. If not, everybody go away. Uh, can I ask Bye. a uh, final exam? Is that going to be like you said it was going to be oral? Um, yeah, yeah, like yes, I'll, I'll, get, I'll give an oral exam. I'll give some information on that next time, okay? Okay. Okay.